Mick Gray chats with Jason Faulkner, May 13th, 2022, part two. I want to get into some sessions and stuff now. And this one is just, what was it like that day you got a call to, to work with Paul McCartney? Yeah, so that was my friend Nigel Godridge, who, you know, I brought in to co-make my second soul record, um, Can You Still Feel? One of the great and, producers ever, man. Yeah, he yeah, he's a great producer. Um, you know, he didn't produce my record, but I but he is a great producer. Was he engineering? And, what what did you bring him in to do? Just I brought him in to engineer and yeah. mix. Mm-hmm. And and he knew that going in. Um, I literally gave him a co production credit in order for him to get fully invested in the record. So it was, it was strategic yeah. uh, because I, because all of the production, I had already, everything that you hear on that record was already, that was just me. Right. Um, and um, so the, yeah. So when he, he called me one day um, and he's like, Hey, I, 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 I'm just contacted by McCartney's people to maybe produce his record. What, do you think I should do it? And I, <laughs> because, you know, hey, it's it's actually, it, it might sound crazy to a lot of people, but it's actually a legitimate question because, you know, you, you know, you're not going to go in and make Revolver. Right. You know, it's, people it's, might, people might just diss you for what the outcome of it was, no matter if it was great or not, because it's this Paul McCartney record they're comparing to Revolver. It, and, and and also to be honest, you know, it might not be the best record that you are could work on, you know. Even though it's Paul, he's made so, he's made some mediocre ones. Even even me, I can say that I love him to death, yeah. but he has made some mediocre. Ones. Exactly. I, and I, <laughs> but um, so you know, I, he said, you know, I'm thinking about doing, it, and I said, well, I think I think you should do it. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> and he said, would you? He said, I don't like his band. So would you be my guy there to like, kind of like, you know, help me steer it in a different direction? That must have been kind of freaky though to walk into that situation. Oh, it was totally <laughs> insane. I'll never forget, I showed up for the first day and I showed up um, a little bit early, you know, maybe an hour before Paul was supposed to show up. And um, I'm not really a session musician and, it, and when I say that, what I mean is like I don't even know if my if my amp works that I brought. <laughs> you know, like, you know if my pedals are creaky and dusty and crackly. I don't. I don't because I because I don't have like a rig as a session session musician. So I show up and I, I granted I have great stuff, but I just sometimes if I haven't used something for six months and I turn it on, it doesn't work. Yeah, fifties. And so I have this fifties. Fender Vibrolux amp, and I had all my pedals, and um, I you know I put, set everything up, and then I'm like, God, I better check this. Out. I better like plug in. I haven't even plugged. In. Make sure this stuff works. And so I'm down there, and I'm like fussing with my stuff, and I didn't even have a tuner in my, but oh. I just by ear. Uh, <laughs> I just hit the piano. That's how I normally record. I just like hit a piano and tune my guitar, and um, so. I'm like, shit, I should have a tuner. I'm like kind of panicking, like last minute panic. I'm looking, looking up and I'm like, God, this is so amateur. Like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm playing with Paul McCartney. And all of a sudden, and then I get this. I'm like literally kneeling down and I get this. And I, um, and, he, and he's right here. And he's like, you must be Jace. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, and I've never ever in my life, listen, I've met, I've met everybody. And I have never in my life gotten those rubber legs that people talk about where you think almost fall over. I'm going to fall over. <laughs> that's, that's what happened right here. And he's like, he's like, it's nice to meet you. And I was like, Oh my, I was just like, yeah, you too, man. Uh, and um, he's, he's let's get at it. You know, let's pick, I've got some songs here. And so we, we immediately, so, basically the the studio was set up we were in the main tracking room and the drummer james gadson from bill withers band mm-hmm. great great drummer dear friend he's he's stuffed into a vocal booth to get that really dead 70s drum sound small room tiny room vocal booth drum sound <laughs> so 
Paul and I are the only people in the studio looking at each other. And he's got his, he's got the Hoffner with the Shea Stadium. And I'm just like, uh, and I'm like, is that the, like, what, what? he's like, oh, that's from Shea Stadium, you know? I'm like, I am like holding his face. I'm like, uh, you know, it's a left beep. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm just like, what the hell? And um, we, he, we just went over to the piano and he started sketching out some ideas and um, we immediately went to work and started recording. And the, one of the funniest stories was, I believe it was the first song that we were recording, the first song that we, the three of us had learned. And, you know, because of Nigel, it sounds so good in the headphones. It's just like, oh my, it just sounds like a creamy 70s rock record in the headphones. And, um, you know, it was a sim- it was a fairly simple song. So like, I, I, I didn't, I made like really crude charts. I didn't even look at them more than, more than one take. And I just had it. But here's the thing. I had it until I, until I, I see, I see some movement and I see, and I look up and Paul's trying to get my attention. And it's like, he's playing the bass and he's like, and he goes, where are we? Like in the arrangement. He was lost. He was lost. And he goes, where are we? And, and, as, and as soon as Paul McCartney asks you where you are in the arrangement, you're now lost. You're, you're done. Right? You're done. <laughs> Dustin. So I, I was like, I, 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 I just looked, I mouthed, I'm like, I have no idea. And then, and then we just stopped and started cracking up. And he's like, this is great, Josh. Yeah, it's great. And um, we uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, under, I understand that nobody else in the world ever calls you Jace either. That's pretty much true. I mean, he, he's the first. <laughs> uh, several people try to call me. <laughs> no. I, I like your, by the way, I like your Paul McCartney impersonation. That was fabulous. It's a douche. <laughs> Your guitar on uh, that, I mean, and and Nigel's production, you're right, is just so slick and smooth. I know it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, he's a very, very good uh, mixer and recorder. Man, well, if you, for those that don't know, Nigel has done all of Radiohead's music after OK Computer. I mean, he's he's their guy in the studio, yeah. and those productions are through the roof crazy. Pretty bonkers, yeah. You were at KMIC Radio and you were enjoying a night of music and talk with the fabulous Jason Faulkner. Thank you for being here tonight, Jason. Oh, man, it's my pleasure, Meg. I appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate you having me. And we did not talk at all about how long you want to hang. So uh, if you, whenever you, you... You are you are unbelievable. I love your stories that you're telling. So you can hang as long as you want, and and uh, I just don't want to hold you up if you need have to go. I, I, uh, because my my phone is not displaying the time. I have no idea what time it is. It is nine thirty nine. Ooh. Uh, and we go till eleven here, baby. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. Well, so since I don't cook, um, <laughs> you need food. Most of my food delivery options are uh, are delivered via a service, and that service usually ends at nine thirty. Oh so, my God! You don't got you're not going to have any food. You're not ha- you're not going to be able to eat. I'm not eating tonight. Do you have any peanut butter and jelly? I don't have any peanut butter and jelly. No. Do you have any bologna? I, I don't have. I have a lot of bologna, but not food. <laughs> How about a banana or something? God damn it! Come on, you got to <laughs> eat. You might pass out on the air here. I pass out. I've also had about six of these. <laughs> um, you better eat some bread or something, man. Let's hang out for a little bit more, and uh, we can always yeah. just, we can always do this again. Oh, I'm happy. Man, you are the you are the best, man. Um, onward. You hung out, toured, recorded with a guy by the name of Beck for. How many years? Uh, from 2002 to 2019. Yeah, yeah, I've known Beck for a long time. We were we were friends before we ever worked together. Um, we were kind of, um, you know, I was I was very uh, flattered to find out that he liked uh, like that he liked that record that you just played that song uh. before before we had even met. Um, but yeah, we've known each other since about '99 or 2000. Yeah. Uh, and the first did with him, 
was uh, Sea Change. Yeah, what and a record! What a record! That's that's yeah, that that record is is breathtaking. Did uh, that that won some Grammys, didn't it? I have no idea. You know why? Because like, or Morning Phases, maybe, maybe Morning Phases won. Morning Phase definitely. We yeah we 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 yeah. That, that as well, and definitely he, he got some Grammys for that. But I'm not sure about um, Sea Change, but you know, Sea Change is a master stroke. And Sea Change is a sea change for Beck. Yeah. It, it actually is a point in his career where he really does a major left turn. A absolutely. I mean, he came from like kind of the collage, you know, artist uh, thing. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, this guy can write a fucking heartfelt song like Nobody's Business. And, you know, it, did, it didn't hurt that he was going through an intense breakup. Oh. At all. That's his breakup album. You can hear it, yeah. Yeah, it was it was pretty it's pretty aching. Um but yeah, like the first thing I ever did with him was uh, Paper Tiger and I remember we um you know, we were all really into Gainsbourg and all that stuff at the time. Mm. <laughs> are, but um but somebody mentioned that Melody Nelson tune and we all just kind of started like playing that sort of and I remember raising my hand it was my literally my first day with all these guys who've been playing with it for for years and i was like um this is it's too close to the, the original i mean you're gonna get skewered <laughs> and uh you know he and he pushed talk back and he's like man thanks I'm, I'm so glad that there's like another sort of songwriter here that like can see that big picture and and kind of call it for what it is and yeah we need to change it because it is too close and um yeah that was just a, that was a really cool session um uh yeah pretty and much all ma I and major world world tours crazy like big arena places right well i didn't tour with him until uh so so he was asking me to be in his band from that point on he was actually asking me to be in his band before that and i think him bring i think he thought bringing me in on that record would like bring me into the fold so that all of a sudden i would be in the band but i was like oh man no no i i'm you know i'm just doing my own thing and you know, appreciate it i'm flattered but uh now i'm i'm not going to be in in your band and yeah. then it, so he, basically it's 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 very flattering because it's kind of like um you know it's like asking somebody out <laughs> and which which i've never done like, so i have no I have zero game of, of asking somebody that I'm interested in out because I've only been approached and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. But, but it also, it also didn't allow me to uh, earn any skills. <laughs> <laughs> you and, lucky handsome bastard. Well, <laughs> lucky, but in a way it's, it's actually unlucky because now that, that all that's fading, and <laughs> no no you're just as handsome as you ever and i'm just like uh i have i like i'm just like i am exactly what i'm doing right now if i'm interested in somebody i'm like uh, 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 like ducky. i don't like ducky for life i love it i love it i love it oh god but, man so he keeps call, he kept calling me back then and he would be like hey i'm gonna do a a tour you want to you want to you know you, you want to get in on it i'm like Nah, no, 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 I'm still doing my own thing, man, you know, for years and years. And finally, like, even, like, this many years later, I think it was around 2008, he calls me and he's like, okay, all right, I got it. I got the one that you're going to do. It's opening up for the Reform Police, and it's three shows, and it's in South America, and it's 75,000 people a night. And I was like, Oh hell yeah! I'm doing that. So that was your was that your first time really playing to monster crowds like that? Uh, yes. Other than the other than the one giant jellyfish show where we played uh, with like in excess and all that stuff. Oh yeah, like at a big festival or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was at uh, Wembley. That was oh at Wembley, yeah. Hey shit. Um, but that was Jeez. the one. That was for me and then all of a sudden yeah we're playing in these massive places with the police and it was it was super fun it was very challenging and i the funniest story was that you know beck had asked me to kind of like unison double his 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 voice on pretty much everything oh my god and i'm like man i'm having enough kind of trouble 
learned music. Um, but look, the lyrics, man, forget about it. Like I don't, I, I know about a thousand songs off the top of my head, but I only know the first verse. <laughs> so I'll, I'll get a party and somebody will be like, "Yeah, oh, Jason, you gotta play," and I'll start playing, and then I, I know the first verse, and then I'm expecting everybody else to. <laughs> yada 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 yada. <laughs> Yeah, to know the song and chime in, and I'm just, and then they never do, and then it just falls apart. And so we do, we do like fifty first verse versions of songs at a party, right? That's that, that's my story. So with Beck, I was just like, yeah, I mean, I know some stuff, but I certainly don't know all of it. Certainly not like the rap stuff because it's, you know, it's all placement and it's, you know, it's very specifically him. How could you double voice his? Well, yeah, when he's doing rap. He, he wanted me to, so I think he overestimated my, um, not only fandom, but also my talent. <laughs> so I, uh, so anyway, this, this is pretty funny. So I, you know, I'd been asking his people when we were rehearsing, I'd been asking for like a week for somebody to write out all the lyrics of the song of this, for all the songs that are going to be in the set. And put him in a giant thing, like a like an oversized thing, and duct tape the spine, so I, like have it on a freaking road case, <laughs> and I can kind of like look at that while I'm singing in front of seventy five thousand people, right? So this particular book of secrets wasn't presented to me until literally an hour before the first show. It oh. never never made it until literally somebody this girl that worked for him came up and she's like here you go and it's all written in sharpie and it's big and it's exactly like i said duct tape's fine and i and so <laughs> i put i was like oh my god thank you thank god finally and i put it on my flight case just to my right on this massive stage in this huge arena and it's outdoor and the first song, I swear on my life, is <laughs> it blew away. I sang something and it's like loser or something. And I'm like, I'm a chimp. And the whole thing, a gust of wind, <laughs> it and blew it into the audience. I just see it go and get shredded by fans. Oh my God. I've got to be fucking kidding me. So I just look at him and he looks at me and we start cracking up. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll just sing the words that I know, you know, like, uh, you know, crazy with the cheese whiz. I got that one. I remember that one. <laughs> That's real life rock and roll right there, man. <laughs> but man, I mean, I got to, I got to hang out with Stuart Copeland and Stuart Copeland was like <sighs> the coolest guy in the world. And I bet he must be cool. And Andy was, uh, you know, asking me about my guitars and like, what's, what's that? And I'm like, what do you mean? What's that? It's a Burns. It's British, man. You should know the burn. But he was like, I don't know that guitar. And I'm like, oh. it, was, it was just such a fun thing as a, as a, I mean, I was a police fanatic. When yeah, I was hanging out with the police, man. Holy crap. Great productions. Who was the producer on those records? Uh, Nigel produced the first one. Uh... And the one is Beck and um, Tom Elmhurst. Uh... Uh... <clears throat> really smooth really clean just oh man it's just ethereal the records man i love the sound of those records got it <sighs> did you get anything to eat i just ordered something yeah thanks yes okay i'm glad you're in about 20. I'm, well you, you were saying you couldn't get it after 9 30 and it was already passed I didn't, well i have to scroll through my normal orders and see who's still who's still connections doing. too right connections this is a hey. This is back. <laughs> if I say Jason, like who? Yeah, right. Oh God. Oh God. Am I missing anything? Is there anything that we haven't played tonight that I should play? Because there's just so much stuff. What about the All Quiet on the Noise Floor record from 2020? What about what is that record? Yes, that record actually came out in 2009, only in Japan. Oh, that's that record. I remember it coming out and I was like, shit, I can't get a hold of this. Yeah, it was a very expensive import. Um, I think that record was like 75. The CD was like 75 bucks. Um, it's out of my price range. Yeah, friend, most people. <laughs> but no, that record, I'm, I'm, th there's that record and there's I'm Okay, You're, you're Okay. The, the I'm Okay, You're Okay I put out in 2006. Yeah. 
and All Quiet on the North Shore was 2009 in Japan. And then uh, thus far, I haven't put um, the first one, I'm Okay, You're Okay, up on streaming yet. But uh, I will. You know, I'm, I'm like, I think those are like actually my best records. Um, like, I'm super proud of those. And they're like a, a nice sort of progression from when I started with the first two solo records. Um, but, you know, I wasn't able to find a label in the U.S. to put them out. So, that really sucks. That Japan really sucks. was like, here, here's money and uh, come to Japan. And the cool thing about Japan, as far as music, I mean, everything is in Japan is cool. But as far as music, um, if you just keep going there, you can see a crazy um, swelling of your of your sort of presence there within like a few years. So and and and, and I'll. I'll prove that by what I'm about to say. Um, the first time I went there in 2006 with the rec with that I'm okay, you're okay record. Um, I played a little tiny place in Tokyo in Shibuya called uh, O Nest, and O Nest is across the street from O West, which is like a big rock club, which is kind of like a you know like 800 seater black box rock club with big stage, very very loud, gr great place to play rock and roll music. <clears throat> oh, oh, Nest across the street is a little micro version of that. It's a little tiny sweat lodge that is phenomenal. And like, you know, again, like the Japanese fans are, are the coolest fans because they're the most like me in that they are completists and they don't, oh. they don't like something because they like it in that moment. If they like something, they have every single thing you've ever done and they have duplicates and they have all the different versions. And that's exactly how I am. That's the way it is. So it was like finding a, a, a nation of people who are rabid fans the way I am. And, and that was uh, a revelation and, and, a, and a beautiful thing. So the first time I went there, I played Ones and I played there twice because the first, it, but it's a tiny place. It's like 190 people capacity, right? And it sold out quickly, so they added another night. So I did two nights there. The next time I went, I graduated to O West across the street, sold that out. And then the next time I went, this is all in the span of three years. But the next year I went, I, I was playing a, a 1700 seater sold out. Holy crap. And it's just like, I wish I could keep going there because God knows where I'd be now. I'd be yeah. playing, I'd be playing, you know, I'd be headlining Fuji Rock if i had just kept going there but you know so that's the reason that those records were only released over there was because the japanese labels were the only people interested in putting them out yeah we have a listener uh here tonight natsuko and i don't know where natsuko is living but i don't either that, where, where... That, that name just made me think oh i wonder if they're from japan can we find well, if they chime in natsuko let us know if you're if you're in japan right now yeah yeah because he, this guy has the fans there, baby. Woo! <laughs> um, um, uh, pick a song from All Quiet on the Noise Floor. Oh, uh... Mm, I heard a good one. Um, maybe The Lion Me. The Lion Me, yes. I, okay, here we go. Let's, uh, now, wait. Before I play that... Yeah. Um, I wanted to also play your latest uh, tour partner, Annie Clark. Yes. You and Annie have been touring the world together for the last, I don't know, like last couple of years, something like that. It's been a year. And you played Saturday Night Live. We did. That was the first thing we did. And I was just in heaven watching it. I'm a big Saturday Night Live fan. I've always, I, I don't, I'm very, I'm not judgmental of Saturday Night Live. I just watch it, you know, because I, and I don't care how it changes. Were you able to hang with any of the people on Saturday Night Live when you were there? Oh, uh, this was this high COVID alert era. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. So you didn't have any. Like, this was like mask. It, it was in and out type of thing, huh? No fraternizing, no, you know, because when I did when I did Saturday Night Live for the first time with Beck. Um, oh yeah. For, for, for sea shame you know i was at an after party and i think amy poehler um 
Tina Fey and myself and one other person made a tree that we were climbing up on each other. <laughs> the, the, the Saturday Night Live after party is no joke. And the, it's also, it's also, it's, it's not been, it's not been uh, exaggerated. It's, it's not really. It's, it goes completely insane. These people are like, we are done for the week and we're going to have a good time. Yeah, yeah. And they only have one day off. And then they're I, back to it. I'm in my early fifties. I need, I need like four days off when I hang out with people like, <laughs> but man, uh, it was, it was not, but this, no, this time there was yeah, no, no parties. No, there was no parties. You're just in and out. You're performing and you're, and you're out, huh? It, it was antiseptic to say the least. It was uh, total. I love Annie. Oh, I love Annie to pieces. She's the best. I got to see Annie a couple times, uh, early in the day when she was just touring by herself with a bunch of effects. Yeah, and that was a blast. She was she was very very entertaining. No, she's actually uh, one of the most badass people I know. Um, I you know before doing this, I I I met her years ago and talked to her for about a half an hour at a party once, and I was like, God, who is that? Who is that person? She's so cool. And somebody was like, Oh, that's Andy Clark, and I was like, Yeah, and they're like Saint Vincent. And I was like, Oh shit, right? Of course, that's why she's so interesting because it's St. Vincent. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know. Um, and this, that was, that was like eight years ago or something. And, um, I then talked to a couple of, couple of, I had a couple of other encounters with her and, um, saw her live a few times with her band at the time. And, um, we, uh, ended up on a flight home from a big, a big festival in Mexico. Um, and I, you know, I was, thank God, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that I'm able to fly in the front of the plane with, with back. Um, and there was one seat next to me and the plane was almost all boarded. I thought it was, I thought it was totally boarded. And then all of a sudden Annie comes on and she, she, she said next to me. So like we ended up totally broing down on that flight. And th this is, you know, five years ago or something, six years ago. And so last year when nobody was doing anything because of COVID, um, you know, Beck wasn't doing anything. And um, Justin, the old bass player with, with Beck, you know, that hasn't been playing with him now for quite a while, but he, to me, Justin is synonymous, synonymous with the whole Beck thing. Yeah. Bass player with the Afro. And yeah, he ends up coming over with you, right? Over to, to work well, with Well, he, he's the one who, so she, she brought him in to kind of uh... So he's the one who called me and said, Hey, I just got off the phone with Annie Clark. And she was like, you know, we're trying to put a band together for this record. And she said, do you think, do you think Jason Walker would do it? And, and, and so that's why I'm calling you. And I was like, Oh man, well, that's cool and flattering. And um, yeah, and, and because here's the thing, like as, as all of this stuff, usually the way, the, the way it always happens is, it's like one thing or maybe like a short little thing. And then of course, you know, once the band, this is an eight person band, right? And it's like, everybody in this band is, is, is a gnarly individual and, and like successful person on their own. So when you get that band together, uh, they don't want to, you know, the management is like, we have to keep booking stuff because we have this band together and it sounds so fucking good. So like, we can't lose any one of these people. And so that's what happened. So, you know, we did S SNL and then we had like one other little show. And then all of a sudden there's talk of a tour and I'm like, well, hey, I still live back. You know, Beck's my, my brother, um, but, and it, but it's the same management, right? As Beck and, and Annie. So <clears throat> I'm talking to management and they're like, well, he's not really doing anything this year. So I agreed to do the tour last year. It was nine weeks at the height of the Delta variant. Uh. It was early. I mean, it was, it was put forth to me by management that we were going to, that we were going to be traveling like a sports team. I quote like a sports team in a bubble, uh. meaning you don't even see like your guests. Yeah. There's no backstage. There is no rock and roll anymore. Nothing. And I'm just like, oh my God, like, I'd rather not tour. Like, just like, so I kept, <laughs> I actually kept calling me like, like, are you, are you sure it's safe? Like, this doesn't sound safe, you know? Right, right. 
and um, they're like, no, no, we're believe believe us, we're keeping tabs and all that stuff, and we did it, and nobody got it. God damn! It was a miracle, but it was a really kind of kind of uh, constricted way of touring. Yeah, and uh, and then you know, I was still kind of on the fence as to what I was going to do uh, moving forward, and um, you know, I just kind of I just ended up like a lot of the the St. Vincent show I, I would say the vast majority of it is extremely choreographed yeah however the interaction between her and i was not <laughs> well and i noticed there's like kind of guitar duels at times oh there's like there's like there's like uh it's it's kind of it's like x-rated guitar duels. <laughs> yeah they are they're very yeah. sexy and i'm i'm all about that so <laughs> And she is a really innovative guitar player. She is a monster musician, songwriter, singer, guitar player, all of it. Uh, so it's it's just it just turned out to be something that was so fun that I just want to keep. Yeah. You know, so you'll be work you'll be working with her more. I mean, yeah, we leave in a month for for four months. Oh my god. Yeah, we're 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 turn we're opening for Roxy Music in October. Are you Sorry. shitting me? All right, sorry, September. Holy crap. Are you coming to, are you going to be playing with Roxy Music when you come to the Bay Area? Yeah. Holy shit. Maybe I should, I was going to, because I've seen Roxy Music like I, as many times as you, I could see him coming through in the last 10 years. And I was like going to pass on this. But if you guys are opening for them, holy crap, I might want to go get tickets for that. We're open. So, I mean, it's Brian, it's Phil, it's yeah. Andy, Andy, and it's Paul. So it's everybody except um, Eno. Right. Or job, right? And of course, Eno's not going to do that because you know you can't wear a feather bow at Dockers. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Well, I'm I'm peripheral peripheral friends with my favorite guitarist in the world since I was 16 years old, Mr. Chris Spedding. So whenever Chris, whenever Brian goes on tour, he brings Chris with him most of the time. This time, Chris isn't going to be on tour with him. So I've always went and seen either Brian on tour or Roxy Music because Chris was playing with him too. That's, that's, that's incredible because I'm a Chris Spedding fanatic, especially the record um, Hurt. Well, at some other point, we should talk about Chris because I have every session he's ever done. Okay, so check this out. So that's session. over 300, 400 sessions. <laughs> no, I'm super, I'm super into Chris Spedding and in fact, um, we, uh, Beck and I, when we were on tour in 2000, just as recently as 2019, um, we brought Matt from Cage the Elephant because we were touring with those guys. I right? love them too. They're great. We brought him to see uh, Brian Ferry at some theater. I think I think we're in Chicago. And I'm like, God, that, that, big, that big guy on guitar looks so familiar. And, you know, and I'm, I'm not close enough my seats are pretty good, but they're not close enough. But it's the hair. Yeah. He's, he's still got the, the motorbike and hair. <laughs> and I'm just like, and I find, I put it together. I didn't, I didn't, nobody told me. I was just like, it's fucking Chris Spedding. Spedding, yeah. And so afterwards, you know, Beck and I went backstage and, and I was, uh, and we were talking to Brian and Brian was sweet as you can be. And then Chris Spedding walked by and I was like, but he was just so not interested in any after show talking. He's just a very, very, he's been on the show and I, and I've, I've known him since I was, you know, probably 20 years old, just because I was such a fanatic, you know, wow. I, I'm going to hook you up, you guys up together. I would love you guys should know each other because you're both amazing. And I love hooking up amazing musicians, man. I would love that. I love Chris Spinning so much. He's just you like, like you say, he's so just down to earth, kind of easy going, like, you know, I'm just, I do the job and I get through it. And this is my job. He's like a, he's like, he, th he thinks of himself as a plumber. And yeah. He's, he's utility. Boom, I come in, I do it. Oh, right. so he's, he's hilarious. He's hilarious. Well, well, I've got one other, one of the quick spedding story. That's pretty funny. So I, I became friends with this guy, Calvin Hayes, a long time ago. He was in that uh, terrible band called Johnny hates jazz. I remember that band. Alan Hayes' dad is Mickey Most. Oh my God! The owner yeah. of Rack, the owner of Rack Studios produced the first Chris Bedding uh, solo stuff. 
Yeah, and also, you know, produced a lot of the 60s luminary stuff. Tons of, of glam rock and all sorts of bubble gum and stuff, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, Calvin and his wife invited me to go see the Pistols when they reformed in whatever that was, 94 yeah. or something. And uh, 94 or 95. And they played the Palladium here in LA. And uh, they picked me up in their car and we're driving and then we go somewhere else and i'm like oh where are we going and he's like oh we got to pick up somebody else we pick up chris petty <laughs> i'm in the back seat of the car and all of a sudden and then there's and then chris gets in and he's in the middle and his girlfriend or wife or what i don't know who she was um are is on the is on the left and i'm just like and I, I went mute. I was just like, you didn't, you wouldn't, you didn't talk to him because you were just, you were you know, dumbfounded. You were sitting next to Chris Fetty. My, my friend could have told me that we were picking up Chris Fetty, <laughs> and I would have prepared a little. Bit. You would have been ready. <laughs> okay, we gotta, we we gotta talk about him more uh, at another time. And like I say, I'll hook you guys up, man. He's a fin fantastic dude, man. Um, what have we missed? Um, uh, somebody was asking about can you can you give us an, a few clues about the new record what where, where are you going with it it's um is it in a different groove is it is it moving somewhere else or is it well it, if anything it's more direct like i like i touched on earlier about the kind of country guys that i like the old outlaw country guys uh. it, it's, it's listen it's not country it's, well, I I just watched a video of you doing uh, Wichita Lineman on acoustic guitar. Yeah, that was a long time ago on tour in, in Europe somewhere. But no, it's it's no, I'm not I'm not saying uh, musically it has anything to do with that. It's just it's a little bit more uh, direct and like to the point and like sort of pleading my case to the listener as huh. as as opposed to some of my 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 back catalog. Um, it. It's, I mean, it's a natural progression because it's still me and it's still me yeah. playing every instrument. I mean, I have a couple of guests. There's one song where Britt Daniels singing background vocals. Wow. And there's one song where the guy, Mark, that's playing with Annie, with St. Vincent, the, the jazz extraordinaire, Mark Giuliano is playing on one song on my record. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything else is me. And it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't think it's going to surprise it's not like it, it's not like I've gone some different direction, just a uh, natural progression. Somebody also asked, uh, any possible chance of the Greys ever doing a reunion? <laughs> I didn't ask it, but I, it's a question that I would like to hear the answer to. I mean, I mean, probably not. Probably. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, do I don't you still, any... do you still hang out with John? Do you, do you still yeah. stay in touch with him? No, I mean, I, Last time I saw John, um, I had done the Oscars with Elton John. Oh. And at, after that party, uh, I'm sorry, after the Oscars, I went to, a, to, the, to the one party that I guess everybody wants to go to. I don't care. I don't know or care anything about all this stuff, but <laughs> there's the, there's the um, whatever, Vanity Fair party. That's where I went. And uh, I saw John there. And um, first of all, I saw Jimmy Buffett, and I was talking to Jimmy Buffett for a second. Wow! And then, uh, and then I, and then John Bryan was like, "Well, hello," and I was like, "Whoa!" Uh, maybe, maybe wouldn't have recognized him. Um, and we talked for a little while, but I mean, I have no, I have no problem with any of those guys. I love all those guys, and Dan, That's Dan, Carol, and I are still in, in contact. That's good. So yeah, yeah, I mean, you don't know the way the world is. You guys could just all of a sudden flop into the same groove at some point, and who knows? It could happen. You never know. Yeah, I mean, Jellyfish has been offered a lot of money to play, even like even like Coachella out here and stuff. And Andy, Andy's just not. Gonna, I, I've said yes. Andy won't do it. Wow, wow, that's interesting. I tell you, man, you are amazing for hanging here with me. And oh man, we, and these people, these are these people are loving you. They I they just they just love you. The the stories you got, you you have a an amazing career here, man. You're telling me stuff that I've never, I've followed you for years and I don't even know a lot of this stuff. It's crazy. I love it. We haven't even gotten my love life, man. Oh man, let's that's, not even go there. That's a book. There's a book. It's a book. No, but the, but uh, no, I really, 
I'm only seeing the same two gentlemen here. I'm seeing Chris Sprouse. Hey, Chris. And I'm seeing Gary Amaro. Hey, Gary. Gary, Gary is one of my re irregular regulars. He's always here. Chris is his, uh, his first time here. He's a great uh, uh, comic book artist. Uh, oh. DC, all sorts of different. He's working on Star Wars stuff right now. Old, oh, so old friend of mine. Nice. And I tell you, K Mc Radio <laughs> is crazy. Oh, and 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 you got some great fans here, Rachel and Chuck Dumock. They're big fans of yours. Big big fans. And and uh, we, I found out that N Nasuko is in Japan. And there's another Kamek listener, Cecil, is in Japan also. So we have two J Japanese I listeners right now. I just saw, I think Rachel asked, who, who is the neighbor? You have a neighbor? Oh, the neighbor. That's a song of mine. So, and now it says, oh man, so now I'm going to say that the neighbor is uh, is nobody. Uh, it's just a completely fictitious. I, I, I had the idea of like kind of being a creepy you know, kind of a loner, sad person who's like sort of listening into um, a more active life next door in like an apartment building, which I've never lived in. Um, and I just, it's completely fictitious, but uh, yeah, I wanted it to, I wanted it to be, um, you know, I mean, it says like, uh, it's human behavior to look for a savior. I'm the neighbor, uh, when you need a savior, come on back to me later it's just like this kind of like sad lonely guy that probably has a lot more to offer than anybody knows but uh <laughs> but that's what it is it's a, it's a it's a figment of my imagination as is um they put it in the movies which a lot of people ask me about because that song is from the same uh, ep that i did and they put it in the movies i had a girlfriend at the time who um actually got you know, I, I used to help her with auditions and stuff because I can kind of, I can kind of understand a script pretty easily. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. And, um, <laughs> but she had a little more trouble sort of meat, meat of it than, than I did sometimes. So I would help her. Whoops. I would, I would, I would help her a lot with that. And, um, and, w and then she finally got this like huge part in a, in a, in a, she got a big TV show and, Ooh. I was in um, Dublin, Ireland when I wrote that song and I found, cause I found out when I was on the road that she got this, she finally got it. We were both like super happy and I was elated for her, but I'm not going to write a song. Like I'm so stuck. My girlfriend got a. am going to write a song of, from the perspective of a kind of slightly seething, jealous, like I gave you everything. Well, now I can't even, now I don't even have access to, you, you know, like, I thought that was a much more, oh, my food's here. Hold on, one, sorry, guys, one second. I have two things I have to address about that song. Please do. The first one is that melancholy snipers will never stop cracking me up. <laughs> that's a great line. I, melancholy I'm pretty, I'm pretty, snipers. I'm pretty sure that's a, uh, that's a, that's a, a power pop band from Akron, Ohio in 1979, but it, I'm kidding. I'm going to look be. for it. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, that'd be it great. It should be. And then the other thing is, is that that weird vocal that I'm doing at the end of that song. That that radio number one. That yeah, thing? that was yeah. that's you. So, yes, that's me. And what happened was that was again that was the first day I ever worked with those guys. Oh my god! And, and they were like, they're like, it was it was me and Ken Andrews from Failure singing backgrounds on that song, and then he then then Nico goes. Uh, Jason, can you uh, do like a crooner? I was like, <laughs> I was like uh, he goes, your voice is so uh, baritone, uh, maybe a crooner kind of thing at the end. And I was like, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, okay, let me try it. So literally playback once and I'm just, that's me goofing around, riffing, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And I finished it and I'm thinking how embarrassing uh, hold on, I'm like, oh, yeah, let me do, let's do it again. They're like, and they're all cracking up in the control no, room. Oh, like, we love it. Yeah, they're like, they're like, no, it's done. You're, it's perfect. It's but why would you, why would you do it again? And I'm like, no, no, no it's not. Per that is so not happening. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and check this out. I I went back in the control room and I was like, so, Nico, like, and JB, you're you're gonna um, 
you're going to like airify this, right? You're going to obscure it. You're going to put it back with some effect. Make it all ethereal, yeah. Do some, do something with it so it's not this embarrassing naked first, first pass. And they're like, oh, of course, of course. So six months later, they're out here in LA and we're listening. We have a listening party at Mike Mills' house. Uh, not REM Mike Mills, but the Mike Mills that designed like the Moon Safari artwork and stuff. Okay, okay. And um, and the filmmaker Mike Mills. And um, uh, <laughs> a bunch of people kept coming up to me, going, "Have you heard? Have you heard Radio Number One?" And I'm like, "No, no, no." I'm like, "So, so what did they do? So, well, yeah, like, what did they, did they even keep that voice in there? It's fuck, it's ridiculous, right?" <laughs> and they're like, and people are like. Um, and they couldn't even explain, so they just would walk away. People are blanking me, walking away from me, at m- mid conversation. And I'm like, "So wait a second. So this this whole party was a listening party of that record, right?" And it gets to that song, and it gets to the end, and it's the loudest thing you can. In fact, it comes. It just jumps out of the record at you. Yeah, they 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 did it. So they did it with this thing called uh, side chain compression. So it basically sucks. It 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 forces its way at the front of the mix and p- pushes everything else around it down. That's what side, ch- side chain compression does. So, and I remember I looked around the room and everybody's looking at me laughing. Oh, oh what a moment. And the French guys are laughing. And I'm like, I'm like, jokes on you. Like it's your, your record. It's your record. Yeah, you like, did it. You did this to yourself. And, and, and but, but then Nico said, Nico finally described, and once I tell you this, you all will understand what they were trying to do, which I didn't know until it was described to me. What they wanted it to sound like was a DJ in an, in an environment pulling up his own voice. Oh. Like, woo, woo, woo. Yeah. You know and so once you know that, it actually makes sense and it actually works. Totally. But the problem, the problem is it's impossible to... Uh, to warn people that that's what they're going for, including the guy who sang it. <laughs> that's a fabulous story. Now we now we all can go back and listen to that in a different in a different way. Exactly. So good. So good. Did you eat? No, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait till we're done. So you're gonna hang till eleven? Wait. What time is it now? You have fifteen minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna hang till eleven. You are the best. You know, there's not that many guests I have that will hang for four hours. You I are. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't know it was four hours. I probably should have watched the. Uh, I probably should have watched the, uh, the warning uh, thing you sent. Me. I gave you a lot of warnings. You, you gave me a warning. It was, it's on me. It's on me. No, well, but it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm really happy everybody's sticking around and. And you do. You have a gang here. This is like not regular. K Mc Radio averages about ten or fifteen. Yeah, and I, I so mean, what, we got a gang. Out? You got real fans. Oh, I don't. I don't how many people are listening? We're uh, twenty right now. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Um, next up, Brendan Benson. Yes. The one Mississippi record. Yes. You produced it. I produced the original version that nobody's heard. Oh, so the version that came out, you didn't, but you're on it, right? You play on it, right? No. You're not even on the one Mississippi record? No. I, so what happened with Brendan was I, he was my roommate. I met a girl when I was in Jellyfish in Detroit who gave me a sweetheart after the show. She came up to me as I was getting on the bus and had a sweetheart in her hand and was just like, hi. And I <laughs> took the sweetheart and I ate the sweetheart. Never take a sweetheart from a strange girl. This, this was before we all know what we know. <laughs> And I, I, I couldn't resist the sweetheart. Not only was I hungry, but she was also really cute. Oh my and God. So, so I took the sweetheart and I said, adieu. And I got on the bus. And uh, six months later, I'm at a place that I, go, I used to go to all the time here in LA. Like after the bars closed, there was a place that we would all go to to have like late night food called Cantor's Deli. It's a very famous place. I've been there once. Yeah, okay, great. It's a fantastic place. So I, I used to hang out at Cantor's, you know, from like 2.30 to 4 in the morning. And I'm in there with some friends. And there's these two girls that are like in a booth, oh, kind of oh, straight up from us. And they keep turning around and looking at me and cracking up. 
and and my friends are like what what's going on here and i'm like i have no idea and i went to the bathroom up these steps and when i came out of the bathroom one of the girls was standing there she goes she's like you don't remember me do you and i'm like i don't uh but you do look very familiar and she goes oh i gave you a sweet tart in detroit michigan <laughs> and i'm like i've been waiting for you my whole life <laughs> Finally, 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 you're here. And we were inseparable from that moment for a year. Uh, crazy. And I, lo I loved her and, and, and she, me, and we had a great relationship. Oh and my God. We were, we were very young and I was, you know, still in jellyfish. But the point is the other girl that was at the booth cracking up at me was her friend whose, whose boyfriend was Brendan Benson. And when ma this girl, the girl that I was dating, her name was Mandy, and, and we, we I, I basically, I was not in town very often. I was touring so much, and uh, but I was, you know, it's like I was 22 years old, and um, uh, all of a sudden, there was a guy in the apartment when I would come stay with Mandy, and it was Leslie's boyfriend. It was Brendan Benson, so Brendan and I became good friends. During that, I had no idea he had any musical aspiration at all. Like he didn't play guitar around me. He didn't talk. I mean, we talked about music, but he, I had no idea he wrote songs, nothing. Wow. And, and um, at one point, I think I, you know, I, I saw that he played guitar a little bit and he asked me to kind of teach him Blackbird, which I did. And, um, and fast forward a couple of years, he sends me, the, he's living in San Francisco now and he sends me, a, he's like, can I send you a cassette of some of these songs I've written? I'd love to like do, like record them with you. And he sends me um, basically like really crude, you know, just like uh, it sung into a ghetto box um, versions of like the, some of the stuff that's on that first EP that we did. So that first EP that we did was basically me being friends with him. It had, there was no motive. There was no like, like professional motive there was no like thinking this is going to get signed or that this guy's anything's going to happen with this guy at all he was kind of like a he was kind of just like a a weird guy that couldn't make up his mind about anything i just thought this guy was like doomed to like work in fast food you know and um he um nothing there's anything wrong with that but <laughs> you know we, we all got to do what we got to do <laughs> exactly, exactly but so we we do those demos are are me playing almost everything and you know but us having such a good time together and also me kind of fleshing out his songs fleshing out his songs and um you know there some songs didn't have a bridge or they didn't have a finished chorus and so i would write that stuff so that's that well well-fed boy ep that's what that stuff is so right? the demos are you and him the dip, dip, are you aware of this well-fed boy EP? It's only on vinyl. Well, now, now the the deluxe edition one Mississippi has has that has the demos. The demos are me primarily and him. It's all just the two of us. Excellent. And, the, and those are what got him signed to Virgin. And that was I, the start of his career. You started Brendan Benson's career oh, with without a doubt. <laughs> I did no, no, not. No, no. I had no idea that you did that. No, no, with, with like without a doubt, and, and I would hope he would he would be honest enough to at least acknowledge that very hard truth. Yes, I I in fact absolutely started the guy's career. Something about that song makes me say that Jimmy Webb would dig that, and I mean I don't know. Are you a Jimmy <laughs> Webb fan? Of course. No, I mean, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't know what it is, but I mean, it has that. Like, you know, we said you covering uh, Wichita Lineman earlier. I saw that. It was old. And I was like, yeah. there's something about Jimmy Webb songs that, like, suck you into the story and make you feel like you're part of it. And that song does that. Well, that's, that's a huge compliment. I appreciate that. Dude, you are the best. This might be <laughs> one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. There's, I want to go out tonight with one more song can you tell us anything a little story behind the rock and roll hall of fame doing satellite of love with beck and roger manning oh uh well yeah that was crazy because yeah we were we we did that to induct blue reed and he had passed you know so laurie anderson is sitting right there and uh 
uh, yeah, that was, that was nuts. Um, I mean, I mean, transformer, you know, transformers. <laughs> how important transformer, is that record? Really? How, how I mean, important? trans, yeah. Transformer is really, really important. I mean, I mean, you know, Lou, Lou Reed to me is like, um, I'm one of the, I'm one of the people that loves his, like I can sing, right. I'm, I'm a singer, yeah. but I love, but I love, I love Lou Reed's sort of talk singing more than anybody would ever probably know about me. Um, and, and the, just the timbre and the tone of his voice is, is so just obscenely cool. It's just always going to be cool. Like everything Lou Reed, I mean, Bubble Underground, yes, of course, but I mean, I'm, I'm into Coney, Coney Island Baby. I'm oh, into, one of my favorite records. Coney Island Baby is one of my favorite records. Yeah. Uh, oh, she's my best friend. Yeah. And, yeah, and, I mean, you, and you bring up Transformer. It's not just Lou. It's it. You've got Mick Ronson it, arrangements and and David yeah. Bowie hanging out, per, help helping co-produce. And I mean that record is freaking somewhere it's, on its own. It's so not. I mean, Perfect Day, Satellite of Life. <sighs> it's so insanely. It's it's basically like transporting an alien into a warm you know cauldron of sonics and you know you just have this guy that is like kind of drug addled and uh but brilliant and it's just it's, it's such a cool extreme the, the extremes of that record sure is blow, blow my mind i i love it to pieces um and yeah so that was that was that was pretty crazy doing that song. That, that must time. have been a pretty amazing having Laurie, his his wife, sitting there in the audience, and you are at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame doing Satellite of Love. Yeah. Jeez. With your pals, <laughs> Beck and Roger Manning. Thank you for being here, buddy. This oh, has man, been a, this has been a great night, and thank you all for being here at KMIC Radio. You're all welcome back. You know we do we do crazy shows er, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, and now Jason just got me like I haven't done a Lou show yet, so I'm going to be doing a four hour Lou show really soon. So get ready for that. Guess what, everybody? I'm going to dress up like Lou. I'll be Lou. We're going to bring Jason in dressed like Lou from the Rock and Roll Animal album. And he's going to be all like there. It's going to be so cool. I'm, I'm going to pay him to do it, actually. <laughs> you, 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 need, you, need to, you need to play the clip that I saved on, on Instagram that I just saw recently where he's, I think some Australian interviewer is like, uh, uh, you know, like, how does it feel to be Lou Reed? And Lou Reed goes, I don't know, how does it feel to be a schmuck? <laughs> <laughs> my favorite Lou Reed quote ever is give me an issue and I'll give you a tissue you can wipe your ass with it that's my favorite Lou Reed quote ever and I saw him on on that tour on the on the take no prisoners tour Lou Reed did not sing a word the band no. just vamped behind him right and he just talked <laughs> the whole night well, I, I, real quick before we go, I have to tell you the craziest. Uh, I was with my, uh, I, I, I had a girlfriend in New York. Another during... girlfriend? Can we do a whole show and you just talk about all your girlfriends? I, I, I would love to. I don't think they would, but. Um, when are you going to uh, make the album that every song is a different girl? Well, <laughs> that's that's a little that's a little cheesy at this point. I think in twenty twenty two, but <laughs> just wait, wait. You well, know, ten years and you'll yeah, be able to do it. <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry. No, but I, I was sitting. I was sitting at a sushi restaurant. She was facing me. We were just starting to date. We were very happy. But right as we were seated, I noticed that just here on my sight line, just past her head to the right, is Lou Reed looking at me and Lori Anderson back of her head. <laughs> Oh no! And and Lou Reed is is staring at me. Oh no! And I had, because I think I had orange slick back hair. I was going through my low phase. Oh! And it was second my second album, and um I I you know I had leather pants on and a tie. You know I mean I I looked like I look the look. I looked like I I looked like I respected his gin big time. <laughs> and he was literally like like this not looking at his wife but looking at me and i remember saying to my my new girlfriend i said i'm so sorry but i'm not present for this conversation 
and I'm not, and I'm never going to be because Lou Reed is staring at me. I'm having eye sex with Lou Reed. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> And, and the the biggest problem with the story is she goes, who's Lou Reed? <laughs> oh, and that was the end of that relationship. Okay, I understand that one totally. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my God. You, but hey, thank, thank you, every, thank you everybody for showing up for this. I really thank appreciate you it. all. This has been fantastic. I, big, and, big and and Jason, I'm gonna send you some books, and we got to talk about Chris Spedding sometime too. Okay, I, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's been fantastic. What a show. Here is Jason Beck and Roger Manning doing Satellite of Love. Thank you, KMIC Radio. Remember, music heals.